Michael Gervais, welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. Dan, I am so stoked to be here with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. By my math, this is your third appearance. And uh, I was thinking back to the last one, which I believe was in 2021 or 2022. You came on with um, Pete Carroll, who was, who, was the, uh, who was the head coach at the time of the Seattle Seahawks. And, and I remember I was in a, we were, I was recording in a closet in, in the house we were renting at the time. And uh, my young son came into the room and announced that we were having tacos for dinner. I don't know if it made the final edit of the show, but you guys handled it with uh, good humor. So oh, that, that was fun. Yeah, that was great. Uh, so you have a new book out now, and it's a great topic. It really, it really got me thinking. But one of the first thoughts I had was, "Huh, what what is the connection between fearing what other people think of us and high performance?" Which is what I've always talked to you about. And you have a good answer, but it wasn't immediately obvious to me. So can you explain it? Yeah. So a bunch of my friends had said, you know, that I was not kind of sharing what I was exactly writing about with them. And then when they saw the title and the subtitle, and so the title is the first rule of mastery, the subtitle, stop worrying about what people think of you. They kind of looked at me like, well, I, Mike, okay, I, I get the first rule of mastery approach, but what, what is this second part about stop worrying about what people think of you? And they were surprised that that was actually going to be my first print book. Um, the the first book that, that you're referencing was an audio book with Pete Carroll. And... So if I were to say, if, if, if you and I were drinking poison every day and we just a nice little shot of poison every day, and I were to say to you, hey, listen, you, you know, the first rule of, of probably overall health is to put the poison down. You say, yeah, 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 that makes sense. So I think the poison that we're drinking when it comes to the good life, when it comes to high performance, and certainly when it comes to you know, the path of mastery is that we are drinking a poison every day. And that poison is this excessive worry, this rumination, are we okay in the eyes of others? And so all I'm, I'm just having a little fun saying, I think it's time to put that poison down. Do you think the poison is more predominant now that this is getting worse? I mean, your, your words in the book, you call it a hidden epidemic. What, so I guess my it's a two-part question is like, what's causing it and is it getting worse? Yeah, I think it is getting worse. And I'll explain some of the conditions to to support that thought. Um, but let's just per first do the biology of it. Like we are designed, well designed to orientate our lives to find safety. That is part of the main dictum of the brain. That 3.2 pounds of tissue is to figure out how to scan the world for danger. And safety, the opposite of, you know, uh, exploring danger is finding safety. And the, a near death sentence a couple hundred thousand years ago was rejection from the tribe. And rejection from the tribe is, you know, is exactly what it sounds like. Is like, uh-oh, I'm about to get kicked out or I am kicked out. That rejection was a near death sentence because it was, it's too wild out there to forge and fend and hunt and gather if it was just the two of us that got kicked out. So acceptance is a really big part of safety. And we are highly skilled biologically to scan the world and find the hint of rejection, just the potential of rejection. And that is so powerful as a dictum for survival that in modern times, we haven't quite squared it yet. We're still dealing with it, but we haven't, we haven't put light on the power of it. And that's all I'm doing here is shining light on this ancient system that is not properly squared for modern day challenges. And then... And then the second part of your question is you add the public nature that most people feel that they are, social media and otherwise, and that is certainly an accelerant to that brain structure that is left undisciplined. It is running wild. It is underneath the surface, doing its thing, having its own party. And we say, why are we so stressed out? Because that resource is um, it's sucking up a lot of energy. Am I okay? Am I okay in the eyes of them? And I'll do whatever it takes, you know, to be able to fit in because that is part of safety. We'll even abandon some of our first principles and our virtues and values to laugh at a joke that we don't really think is funny, or we don't even know the lines of the movies that people are referencing and 
but we don't want to be left out of the joke. So we laugh, you know, it's like those small little subtle ways that um, we're conforming to be liked as opposed to just saying, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really, that all of that really lands for me. I mean, I, I think about, I sometimes think about with my mind at least, and I suspect this is true for most people that I'm just walking through the world, constantly sending out these anxious sonar pings of my, how am I doing? How am I doing? What does this person think? Am I, am I okay? Am I okay? Am I okay? And, um, uh, and as you described it, this is like a blessing and curse of human, of the human design, um, or, or the way natural selection designed us, which is that we're intensely social. We, we, our strength is that we can work together, but our Achilles heel is that if we don't have social approval, uh, we feel very unsafe for very good reasons because on the savannah, as I often say, a lonely human was a dead human. And, and, and then you go on to say that now that we're living in the panopticon of social media where everybody's a brand, uh, this is just on steroids. That's exactly it. You, you, yeah, you've, and so here's the opportunity. It, we're just putting light on it and shining it. And I don't think that what you and I just said is all that novel or new. And I'll tell you what happened is that I, I was 16 years old. This is the epicenter um, of, of this um, shadow self that I was playing a game you know, in my life. I was 16 years old and I had just saved up for two summers to get my first car. It was a Mazda B2000, a little pickup truck. And it was like two grand or something. <laughs> and I was, I'm driving down Pacific Coast Highway in Southern California. And I can tell that there's a car behind me and it's going a little bit faster and it's going to pass me going in the same direction. And I straightened up. I grabbed the steering wheel to look a certain way, to look cool. And I thought to myself, they're going to look inside this car and see a cool kid. And so I got that lean and I was driving and I, I, I didn't want to be obvious. And I just kind of glance over at the car that's passing me that I was propping up literally the, the cool posture. And they, Dan, they never looked in. <laughs> they never looked, they, they never looked at my car. And I thought to myself as a 16 year old kid, like, what am I doing? What, what did I, what was all of that activity? And I knew that that was not the right way to go through life. And I instantly felt all that heat in my body, like this big truth telling signal that this is, you are, you're a phony. You're just trying to look a certain way. You are totally faking it. And that's a bit of a fraud approach that I had in uh, insight that, I, that was a bit of a fraud. And I knew that I knew how to fit in and be okay in social settings. And that stems right back to early childhood trauma for me. So I knew how to do that. But I didn't know how to be all me, all of me. But it was so kind of embarrassing and quiet that I never announced it or said that this, I'm trying to figure something out, you know, like I never talked about it. And then fast forward like 20 years later when I had um, the privilege as a sports psychologist to work with some of the world's best. And it's a private conversation. We're doing good grounded psychological work. And the world's best are saying, hey, you know, I just don't want to look stupid out there. There's millions of people watching. And I, Dan, I know you know this. <laughs> and I don't want to let my agent down. I don't want to let my parents down. I don't want to let my neighborhood down. And so one of the great fears was not getting hurt, even in rugged environments like American football or MMA. It was not that. It was more about the way that other people were thinking about them. So I said, oh, there's something here. I'm not alone in it. And there was some relief in knowing that there's others that are, have the same struggle as me. And then so three years ago, I wrote an article for HBR, three-page article, uh, just to get some of these ideas out. They called 12 months later, Dan, and they said, um, Dr. Gervais, you, uh, you are the number one downloaded article 12 months in a row. You touched a nerve. <laughs> so this thing about this fear of other people's opinions, it's why public speaking is so important such a radical fear for us. It's, there's, there's no marauders, there's no snipers, there's no like uh, people that are gonna physically harm us if, this, if we don't find the right words or the speech doesn't come out correctly. The dangerous thing in an audience is their eyeballs, their opinion of us. And so I just wanted to get underneath the surface of what is that? And we had just, we had fun, we called it FOPO, kind of a, a cousin of FOMO you know, fear of people's opinions. And that that's kind of the origin story from my personal experience to world-class to, you know, the, the, the most of us 
around the fears that we have of wanting to be okay in the, in the eyes of others. We're going to talk at great length because you, you talk at great length in your book. We're going to talk at great length about what to do about this, but let's just stay on the uh, downsides of FOPO. What can you say about how, uh, how this poisons us? Well, it, it's a um, it's a corruption to the path of knowing what you're truly capable of, because you, I, I'll just use myself. I continually shape shift and conform, and sometimes contort even to what they want, as opposed to what I believe to be best for me and them. And so I'm I'm serving them. I'm outsourcing myself, my sense of self, and my identity, and my self worth, and my sense of belonging to them. And the, the big culprit is that it, we never know truly what we're capable of because the, the primary game is to fit in for safety rather than the primary game of authenticity and potential. So that's one. The second is the, the ram that's running underneath the surface to do all of that social pinging, to use your earlier language, that, that, that is very expensive as an organism to run. And we are in a human energy crisis right now. We are tired. The, the, the human experience in the Western world is we, are, we have fatigue and agitation and depression and anxiety and addiction. And we're just, we've got this soup where we just feel more tired than I remember us in my 50 years of being on the planet that I ever remember. And, and we might want to point to the external conditions like a pandemic and social upheaval, certainly in the United States. Um, but that's, that's not a good enough answer because the dark ages were way harder, right? Medieval times were far more dangerous and, and consequential than the lap of luxury that we have today. So it's not that the external world is creating this internal fatigue. It's that we haven't properly invested and in, on our psychology, we haven't done the work that you've suggested for many years that people do, which is like, hey, pay attention to how your thoughts work. Pay attention to how you work with your thoughts and emotions. Work from the inside out. And when we do that work, we end up being able to meet the demands of any moment. And so we've got this reverse polarity that's taking place where we think that we are um, not living the good life because the external world is not favorable for us. It probably never will be, by the way. <laughs> you know, the world is not designed for you to thrive, Dan, <laughs> for me to be great. It's not designed that way. It's actually quite harsh. And so it requires this internal investment in psychological skills, which I know you and I vibe in the same way. I didn't learn those psychological skills in grade school, in high school. I certainly didn't learn them in college. Where do we go learn them? Because we're, we're kind of forced up against some sort of crisis or pain to say there's got to be a better way. And this, this, this chronic fatigue that so many of us are feeling in the, in the modern work, work way that unfortunately it's not sharp enough to make the radical changes. We oftentimes need acute pain. We need something to really grab us attention rather than the, the slow, slight decay over time of vibrance. That, that doesn't give us enough of a amplification to say, I'm making a change. <laughs> Evidence by why, you know, I don't know, six weeks after New Year's resolutions, people tend to fade away to their best commitments. Yeah. Just want to push you a little bit to say more about how damaging FOPO is. I'm going to read you back to you and, and then shut up and let you... Uh, <laughs> amplify what I've just read to you from you. Um, quote, FOPO shows up almost everywhere in our lives and the consequences are great. When we let FOPO take control, we play it safe and small because we're afraid of what will happen on the other side of critique. When challenged, we surrender our viewpoint. We trade in authenticity for approval. We please rather than provoke. We chase the dreams of others rather than our own. Yeah. Um. I know the first thing when you play that back to me, I go, "Oh, that was that was good." And so I, I like I like what, I like what I wrote there, and I think it summarizes it pretty good. Like there's a there's a sadness to this, um, to this facing of FOPO that, you know, the sadness for me is what what have I done with my years I've been on this planet, and not achievement or notch of the belt, 
but like, how am I shaping the way that I experience experiences? And if the primary um, dictum of the brain is survival, and I'm just listening to that dictum and not overriding that dictum to meet modern dilemma, to meet modern challenges, that's what psychology is really about. The programming of the hardware, right? The software to hardware. The brain is the hardware. The software is the, the, the mind. And so I, I think that there's a sadness that comes with it. And at the same time, hopefully like as a quick second drop, it's like, and there's something I can do. So the cost is great. Evidence by how you just explained it. And the excitement is, okay, yeah, I've been living too long playing that game, that second game, that shadow game. What can I do about it? And so there's a whole set of things that we can go through and talk about, but I don't know if you want to move off the sadness piece yet. <laughs> no, no, let's stay on the sadness just for a couple more beats. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I'm, let me ask you a question I'm sure you get all the time. Don't, don't, don't we need to care what other people think of us? I love that question. And you, you change the word from worrying about people's thoughts to caring about people's thoughts. Hmm. And I'm ringing the bell on worrying. And I, yeah, I would never ring the bell to stop caring. So there's a difference, right? And so um, the people who don't care are sociopaths, narcissists, um, and maybe the enlightened. Maybe those are the ones that don't care. I don't, I don't know about the enlightened, but I know that sociopaths and, and narcissists really don't care all that much. We don't need more of them. We have enough. Those spots are taken. <laughs> and so I think the worrying, the excessive worry, am I going to be okay in their eyes? That's the culprit. That's the poison. That's the, um, the soup. That's the broth of the soup of depression, anxiety, addiction, fatigue. And um, that, I, that's the bell I just want to ring out loud or put some light on, which is it's this excessive worry. And, and you say, well, what does that mean? I tried to explain this in saying that there's at least three phases to FOPO, fear of people's opinions, this excessive worry is the first is the anticipation. And I think it shows up as an easy analogy when, you, when you're in your closet and you're picking out clothes for an event and you're looking at different things that you could wear in your closet and you're, the filter is, yeah, will Johnny like this? Will Xander like that? Will Susie think that, you know? And you're thinking about the way that you're going to be perceived and the anticipation of all the conversations and the things that are going to take place later has an anxiousness to it. So the bulk of this process is the anticipation phase, as opposed to when you're in your closet and you say, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling sweater today, or I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling jacket today or whatever. Like you, you're, you're working from the inside out and it sounds super simple and it's, it's so slippery. This filter is so slippery. It's, it's as slippery. Let me kind of go out of the closet for a minute and go into the social event is that if you feel unco uncomfortable, awkward, um, maybe you, you open up your phone to send a signal that, you know, you got other stuff going on. Like, you know, like you're a busy quote unquote person. That's FOPO at work. Or like I said earlier, laughing at a joke that you don't even know kind of the movie, but you don't want to be the one left out or holding a cocktail when you don't really want to drink, which again, you don't want to be the one that's weird or different. And it's that pressure, if you will, so, um, so it's incredibly slippery and it's a big anticipation phase. And then when you're actually in the social environment, it's this constant pinging and checking and it's looking at micro expressions and tone of voice and body language. And like, are they talking to me? Are they, are they critical of me? Are they liking me and doing whatever it takes? And I sound obnoxious when I say it, but it, it's that hoping and desiring of, of being accepted and, and at the extreme case of FOPO, we completely lose our way. But the more pedestrian, more common version of FOPO is just feeling that tension when you say something and people skip over it or not quite sure if you can get in the rhythm of the conversation because maybe what you have to say is going to be not heard or received well, you know, so that it's that more subtlety that is the big tax so it's that checking. And then the third phase is the way you respond, which is, you know, um, conforming or contorting to the, the, the norms as opposed to um, playing your own instrument and enjoying that rhythm. 
As I'm listening to you speak, I'm realizing that FOPO, even though it's ostensibly about other people, is a kind of self-centeredness. Oh, yeah. And yeah, we and we went after that in the research as well, is that that phenomenon called um, the spotlight effect, is that we believe, people believe that we are under a spotlight, that you, Dan, are attending to my sweater and my shirt and my hair and the tone of my voice, whereas in reality, like um, you're attending to what you're saying and wearing and how your hair looks. So we all have this, not all, most of us have this spotlight effect where we think we're at the center of the stage when in return, we're not paying as much attention to the other person as we are to our mm-hmm. own selves. So we end up walking around like these individuals masquerading like we're social animals, but we are fundamentally social animals. And so it's this weird corruption of um, how we're designed to be interwoven, interconnected tribal community members. And what gets in the way of it is, am I being accepted by the masses, by the others? And that's where the beginnings of the spotlight effect are. And it was a fun experiment that happened in Cornell. And I'm happy to talk about the research or or maybe we can yeah, just nod. go for it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Professor Gilovich, Gilovich, Thomas Gilovich, a brilliant mind. He created this uh, experiment where he had um, a, a group of about a hundred freshman students, as most most research experiment designs are. <laughs> you know, freshmen are the guinea pigs there, and so he has a, a hundred in a um, lecture hall, and he's got a handful that are walking in individually. So he's got some in a waiting room, and each one walks in individually by themselves uh, alone. And the researcher says, "Right, we want to give you this shirt, and it's a Barry Manilow shirt, and it's got this big picture of the." The, uh, the emblem of uncool, <laughs> you know, like Barry Manilow is not the, the shirt that these kids want to wear in front of their peers. They say, all we want you to do is walk in front of your peers, do this little thing, like sign some paper. You're not saying or doing anything, you know, um, majestic here. Just sign some paper, stand there for a few minutes, do a thing, and then walk off. And how, how many people do you think are going to notice you? And those that were in the room um, by themselves dramatically overestimated the attention that they thought people were going to observe them with. They thought that the the room of a hundred people, like most of them are going to see them and recognize that they are wearing an uncool shirt. And that was like, that was the big insight. Most people in the room, it was like 25% noticed. And the individual thought that it was the majority of people would notice. Mm. So, it, you know, they dubbed it the spotlight effect and it's a clever little experiment to reinforce that we are not at the center of the universe. <laughs> you know, just, just to be clear. <laughs> it's a useful reminder. Are there gender or even uh, racial angles here? Like uh, uh, if you're not part of uh, the, if you're, if you're a, in a, from a marginalized community or a community that's been mistreated in any way, are you more or less likely to be obsessed with how people are perceiving you? Okay, so I think that that probably doesn't point to gender. Um, we didn't find that in the research. It points more to identity, the way that you formed your identity. And so there was one interesting gender finding, which was, um, it, it's related, but um, let, let me just open it up now, is that they put uh, folks into a room by themselves and to give them space to be with their own thoughts. And it was born out of this idea that oh, I just wish I had more time to just be with myself and, you know, like just be clear with my thoughts and and, and have that contemplative experience where I could really understand myself better. Like it would be great. And, but I'm so busy and I just don't have enough time to think. Okay. So they said, right, let's create an experiment. And what they did there is they, they gave people a shock, an electric shock before the experiment started. And they said, um, how was that? And they said, oh, that's, that's awful. <laughs> like that I'd pay not to be shocked like that. I said, okay, make a note of it. And then they created a space where they could be by themselves and their own thoughts. And um, come to find out, people would rather shock themselves than be with their own thoughts. <laughs> it's like so dangerous inside your own head sometimes that people say, yeah, 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 give me that shock thing. Let me stimulate something here to have me bounce off of. And there was a gender difference um, uh, between the two. And so... Uh, 25% of women um, broke up their their thinking time with electric shock. And then 
um, 67% of men <laughs> chose to, to shock themselves. And uh, one, one male had something like, um, he shocked himself like 600 times. <laughs> and I don't have the exact number. I think, no, it was just under 500. It was 490 times. So there was a gender difference between the two and that poor, that poor one person, you know, <laughs> I would not want to be in that guy's head. Um, so that was the gender difference that we found. There's a higher tolerance maybe to, for women to be with them themselves than for men. Shocking, I guess. <laughs> not really. And so, um, but let's go back to your question was really about what I was pointing to was your identity, one's identity. And identity is this, um, for most of us, it's this junkyarding patchwork type of sense of self. And it, it's, it's, it's passed on by your parents, how they see you and think about and you and performance and culture and how you fit into the wider, you know, sense of, of, of community. It's the magazines that you picked up. It's the way your neighborhood talked about things, the way your community in large talked about things, the culture of, of you and your people. Like, so oftentimes identity is, um, is passively formed. And in the Western world, we are performance obsessed. And it would, it makes perfect sense to me that out of, out of a performance obsessed culture, how well you do and how you stack up against other people and how popular or how, how much money you make or whatever the, the, the metrics or the scoreboard is, that it makes perfect sense that people in a uninformed way would create a performance-based identity. Performance obsessed culture creates performance-based identity. And performance-based identity by definition is I am what I do and I am what I do relative to you. So um, I'm trying to prop up as big as a, of an identity as I possibly can, which means I feel better if you and I are in the same sport or the same industry and I'm doing just a little bit better than you, that now my performance is, is more intact. That's many of us. We don't have a name for it. We don't walk around saying, oh, that's your performance-based identity. You know, like it's, it's kind of a nameless thing at this point. But what we found is that people that have a performance-based identity, that's a radical on-ramp to FOPO because mm. you are paying attention to who you are relative to how others are doing the same type of thing. So there's an othering um, tuning fork as opposed to a purpose-based identity. And so that migration from a performance-based identity, which I think is makes sense that it's there. I don't think it's very healthy. It's quite exhaustive. It might get you to the world stage. You might make a lot of money on it and literally be the best in the world or one of the best in the world, that, the thing you do. But it's not the path for the good life. It's not the path for, you know, the contourness of and the shaping of flourishing or happiness and joy. Okay. Again, it'll get you good at something though because there's a little bit of anxiety that sits right underneath the surface. But that migration from a performance-based identity to a purpose-based identity is the on-ramp to FOPO is performance-based and the off-ramp or one of the off-ramps is purpose-based. And purpose-based identity is exactly what it sounds like, Dan. It's um, I'm connected to something far bigger than me and I'm committed to adding to that large, meaningful endeavor that really matters to me. And I'm a, I'm a cog in that wheel. I'm part of that ecosystem and the rooms I go to and that I'm going to do public speaking or private speaking, like I'm, that's coming forward now. And it's not look at me, it's I'm pointing to the bigger thing. And that is such a relief to people that um, there's no reason there's such a up earth right now, up earthing of how, how healthy a purpose-based identity is. You said before that you can ride a performance-based identity to being world-class at something. Can you ride a purpose-based identity to that same level of mastery and achievement? I think a purpose-based, when I think a purpose-based identity, I tend to go to folks that change the world and um, changed lives, you know, in radical ways, whether we know them or not. Some of the most powerful purpose-based um, people, we we don't know who they are because they're a single parent raising three kids, knowing that they ne they never went to college. I'm making up a scenario, and they've got two three jobs to be able to 
you know, aligned to a, a purpose bigger than them, which is giving their kids a better go. And, and, and then, so if you take that mechanism and you shine light on someone who's sh- struck the timing in a more interesting way, you know, where um, Mandela or Gandhi or Jesus or Buddha or Mother Teresa or Eleanor Roosevelt or fill in the blanks, that these people that are um, global game changers, that they were purpose-based. And without you and I even studying um, um, Mandela's, you know, history, most people know what he stood for. Most people know that Mother Teresa stood for compassionate, you know, taking care of other people that didn't, you know, that had had uh, physical ailments and, and were suffering in that way. She's like, no, I'm doing this thing. I don't, I know, I know that you don't think I should. And I know you think I'm going to get leprosy myself, but like I'm committing my life efforts to healing. And uh, I hope you want to be part of it. And if you don't, that's okay. Love you anyways. But I got something I'm trying to do here, you know? And so that type of rich purpose, they are emblems for what I would not, I, I think there's a difference between a life of mastery and a high performance life. They look the same from, from the outside, but on the inside, the life of mastery a la purpose has a shaping and a contour. There's a warmth. It is not the, and there's an agitation and tension that comes with it because it's so important and big, but high performance is more metallic. It's more execution. It's more about delivering on time and at a high level. They look the same from the outside, but the inside they they feel radically different. And so I would double down on your question, Dan, and say, oh yeah. Purpose-based, I think actually can go further than yeah. just high performance alone. Let me go back to this this thing about race and gender for a second. I guess what I was trying to go at, I guess what the, 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 I, I don't know enough from the inside to understand what it's like to be in the situation because, but well, both of us are white men, so we're part of the sort of dominant culture. Um, but if you're a woman in a male dominated world, or if you're an indigenous American in a white dominated world, aren't you going to be pushed by exogenous factors outside of your own makeup or even internal training into a world where FOPO becomes a pretty necessary and defensible survival tactic? So there's, um, there's a thing called second self, um, or code switching that I've learned um, eloquently from athletes, you know, specifically um, African American athletes that uh, talk one way in uh, amongst their peers, you know, whether it's an athlete or it's a group of black athletes and uh, coaches who, in some some sports in the NFL, there tends to be a disproportionate relationship between um, ethnicity between the two groups. Coaches tend to be more white, uh, athletes tend to be more more black in general. And so there's this idea of code switching. And um, it's this idea that I, I know how to act a certain way in both groups, but the tax of having to switch is a tax that um, many people don't really appreciate how taxing that, how expensive that is. So second self or code switching, second self in this way is also shows up like I'm one way at work and then I'm at, when I'm at home, I'm different. That's a code switch as well. It's not as dramatic as having to switch code inside the walls of business. And, you know, there's a little bit of a, um, a lower drag when you've got time to, to code switch between work and home. But mm. inside the walls of, of an organization, it's incredibly expensive. And it, that is gender and um, BIPOC uh, uh, tuned. To the, that they, they are more... Um, feel that they need to play a different game. Sometimes this is not for everybody, of course, that there's a second game that they need to play, which yeah. again, any second game is expensive, you know? And so, yeah, I, I, um, I, I think that that's a real question that you're asking and it's, it's an expensive mechanism to run. What do you advise your patients or clients in these scenarios? To at least address um, how the choices that they're making and to have a conversation about the risks on either side. And so there's one, she was a senior um, executive, um, senior executive at a multinational corporation tech company. And 
we did a bunch of deep work on her personal philosophy, which is just basically one or two sentences that at, as best they can articulate her first principles in life. So personal philosophy is like, what really matters to you? What are your first principles? And can, can you get it into some sort of colorful couple sentences, knowing that there's a whole bunch underneath, you know, a whole bunch of other principles that sit underneath there. But what are those first principles? So she got really clear. She read it out loud. Um, you, I could see her throat begin to change the, her shape. I could hear it in her voice. Uh, there was that swelling behind the eyes. Her temperature in her in her face changed. Her her eye dilation changed, and she just made this contact with me and her eye contact, and she said, "This is so true. This is me. This is really what I stand for." And I just kind of held that moment with her, and she said, "But I can't be this person at work." I said, "Okay." So give it give it a little bit of breath, you know, a little bit of space to 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 have her feel those emotions. I said, so what do you want to do about that? And she says, well, I, I, I don't know. I think I need to quit. I said, that's one option. What other options do you have? And she says, well, I could go in and just kind of be that person, but I'm sure I'm going to get fired. So, okay, that's another option. What's a, what's a, what's a, what's the third option we could go? And she goes, there are no, it's one of those two. Either I go in, guns blazing, this is me, this is how I'm going to show up. And she was afraid that the people in power one hired somebody that was A, B, and C, and she was more D, E, and F. And, and so she was afraid she was going to get let go or marginalized. And so the, the question was, go find a new environment or be you in the current environment. And she chose the latter, which was, I mean, remarkable courage required to do that. And I'll make this even more personal is that my wife and I were seven years into our marriage and we dated in high school, we dated in college, we got married seven years in. She said, I love you. I don't know how to be me around you anymore. And this isn't working. You got to go. And I'm going to, I'm going to strip away some of all, all the drama and the pain that went into that. And so I left. I didn't want to. It was my best friend. I didn't want to, but I was, I was selfish and I was over indexing on my career and what I needed. And she was losing her way of who she was. And as a best, she's crying. And she says, as a best friend, you have to move out. I said, holy shit. And I know as a psychologist that um, separation is like the, the, the fast track to divorce. Most people that separate never make it back. So here I am leaving, knowing that this is likely a divorce. And a, a month later, um, a month later, I called her and I was like, hey, listen, um, can we get our ass into therapy? She's like, I'm done. I said, come on. As a psychologist, like, I just, <laughs> I need one go here. Can we just go one session? And she says, um, she goes, okay, you know, out of the 15 years, like, yeah, we owe it to ourselves. So we find ourselves in therapy and uh, I've got Italian roots. She's got Latin. She's full Cuban and, and El Salvadorian. We are at each other. First 15 minutes of therapy, the, the wise woman stops us and she says, all right, this is about as bad as it gets. And she asked a question, Dan, that was um, only a wise person would answer or ask. And she says, Mike, you know, you need to do work. And I go, yeah. And she says, Lisa, do you know you need to do work? And Lisa's like, yeah. She goes, okay, here's a question. Do you want to do the work with each other or do you want to do the work with other partners? <laughs> Dan. I was like, holy shit, that's a question. Oh my God. Like, that's the question of all questions. My heart dropped. I was the most vulnerable I think I've ever been in an intimate way. Like this is a, 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 a one-way one door here. And she said, I want to do the work with him. I just don't think that he can handle who I want to be. And I, I felt like I was just like, I had a shot and I was going to commit everything I had to create the right relationship for her to be everything that she wanted to be. And, and I share that intimate story because I know what it feels like from that intimate, vulnerable love perspective to, um, to be in a position to say yes or no, that I want to do the work here, or I want to do the work in a fresh start somewhere else. And I think once you do this, some of this internal work and you're more clear about your first principles in life, your philosophy, let's call it, the vision of who you want to be, the purpose that you are committing to 
and the values that are going to help guide you along the way, and you have some sort of clarity about your self-discovery process or your self-discovery of who it is that you're becoming, and then you say, either I'm going to show up in this environment, wherever that environment is, that work environment or, or whatever, as that person, or I'm going to go fresh start. That is completely the right that we all hold. There's pros and cons on each side of it. And I think it's a cool experiment to try to at least give yourself a go in the current environment. But I also think that like the, the wisdom inside of people is pretty flipping cool. And people do know what they need. And oftentimes um, what gets in the way of the knowing and the doing is like let that fear of what could happen if it goes wrong. And so um, so I share a long story, two, two narratives about, uh, I think it's this is one of the rites of passage to adulthood mm-hmm. is who do I want to be? Who am I? Who am I trying to become more often? And uh, do I have the right set of, of community members to have my back, um, to partner with me, to be a great teammate, to go the distance, whether that's work, at home, friendship, whatever it might be. So thank you for telling those stories. I really appreciate that. Um, and it kind of leads me right to the, what can we do about this portion of the discussion? Uh, because in your book, you say, and I'm, I'm going to quote you again, the single greatest bulwark against FOPO is having a strong sense of self that we we need to figure out what do we care about? What's our job on the planet? What's our purpose? And that will provide us with some armor against against a very common trap. The twist, you say, though, is <laughs> the best way to, f- to do this, the best way to figure out um, what you're all about is to focus on less on yourself. So can you explain that? Yeah. I mean, it's the a performance-based identity is focused on self and a purpose-based identity is focused on other. And it, it's forcing us to get back to what I would imagine you'd be very familiar with is the, some of the first principles in, in Buddhism, um, which, you know, I'm always, um, I put an asterisk next to my deep understanding of all the principles of Buddhism because it's such a wonderfully mystic uh, set of principles, but um, the interrelated interconnectedness of all things. And so we are more like a coral reef than we are these individuals that are, are just kind of bouncing around each other. And that that is like pointing to, that statement I'm making is pointing to um, when you're when you're attending less to your needs being met by others, that you you have more available resources to pour into something that is bigger and better and than than only you can achieve and perform. And so that's pointing back to the purpose thing. It doesn't mean that you think you're you're not taking care of yourself. That's not it by any means. You know, know how to have your life vest on before you can help another's is is also a first principle. So This is working from the inside out. And when you have a sense of deep trust of yourself, that there's a freedom that comes with it, that you can go into um, wildly diverse environments and be okay, be you, be a learner. You know, it's like Bruce Lee was probably relatively free (laughs) from fear of being mugged in in dark alleys where, you know, I got to watch my back. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to take care of myself the way Bruce Lee did. And the same is true psychologically and emotionally. And so it's, it's what I'm, I'm not suggesting, um, don't take care of yourself in service of something else and be exhausted by it. I'm saying work from the inside out, develop that sense of buoyancy so that you can be okay in calm waters and rapid, uh, rapid, you know, rapids of life. So that, that's, that's in, in essence what I'm Yeah. I mean, I, and I think what's, what's interesting and tricky sometimes is that the buoyancy is not going to come from self obsession and navel gazing. the The key to understanding yourself is to, is to understanding what is your purpose, and most most often the purpose has to do with other people. Um, and you know, what, you you invoked Buddhism. One of the phrases that gets tossed around in Buddhism a lot is 
for the benefit of all beings. And one of the things I like to point out is that the letter A there, all beings, that that, that includes you, right? So the, the this is a this is an interesting line to walk. Is you know having a purpose that is externally oriented without leaving yourself out of the equation. Yeah, I th- I think um, this uh, I'm going to use a, an overused phrase that has so much weight to me that I don't have a better way to articulate it in, in just this phrase, but it matters so much, is the, the commitment to being your very best. When you fundamentally commit to that and you've got relationships that are committed to, um, the, hold on, let me start in order. This fundamental commitment to you being your very best. When, that, when you do that and you, at some point you end up graduating from the look at me approach um, to the how can I help you and our very best is not self-preserved. It is, is, it is not self-referenced. Our very best version is in service of. And um, evidenced by like this max axiom that's showed up in elite sport forever and not necessarily has made it to ESPN and you know the local news or, or national news. Nobody does it alone. Usain Bolt doesn't do it alone. Tiger Woods doesn't do it alone. None of the greats do it alone. There's a team and they are part of that team. They are the one that's out there, you know, so they are actually hitting the putt by themselves, but it's all in context of a larger ecosystem of teammates and people that are supporting each other to be their very best. So it starts with this idea of committing to be your very best. And then when you can get a community where when you have a sense that you are moving from suffering and struggling into that flourishing, thriving sense because you are you have worked on yourself. You know how to think and feel and take care of yourself. And you're not whipped around by the external demands of the world, but you can be grounded and have some weight and you can trust yourself that you are then find yourself like, how can I be part of something where people are doing the same for me and I'm doing the same for them? And then you get this really yeah. cool rising tide. And that that type of energy where the noses are pointed in, in a certain direction together and you've got each other's back and you're really committed to helping each other be their very best, it, it is quite magical. It's almost defies language and what happens in those types of relationships. And it can be something as concrete as sport to something as radically um, um, loving as a family and something as purposeful as like a, a, you know, I don't know, children that are, are you know, without homes. Since you brought up sports expressions, one of the expressions from sports that I have a little bit of a beef with is there's no me in team. I mean, literally, it's wrong. There's an M and an E in team. Um, but also, there, it's about a balance <laughs> between um, your interest and other interests and, and your role in the collective and your your needs. And that's life. Um, and so to say there's no me in team is to put people in a state of shame or guilt if they're having any thoughts about their own needs. And I, I actually think it the, the one of the arts of life is balancing your needs versus the, the larger needs. Oh, I think you're right on it. I know the phrase as there's no I in team. Uh, and so the no me in team, you're right. That is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that phrase. I know that there's no I in team. And so um, I'm wondering if, uh, if, that, if that's the reference for <laughs> that we're looking Probably I might've fucked that up. Nonetheless, <laughs> I remember in high school them yes. saying no me and team, but maybe my had, you know, dumb coaches. Oh, that is so funny. Yeah. And, but, but, but to, let's extend your, your thinking there. There isn't a me in team. There is an I in team. You are a yes. teammate. And oftentimes like people, coaches or executives, you know, will say, Hey, Mike, like, how, what does it take to have a great team? And so that's quite simple. Um, great teammates. That's, this is not hard. So it's the commitment to be great teammates to each other. Um, great teammates in, in, in some sort of tension and harmony towards the shared purpose or some companies call it a mission, but it's about having each other's back. It's about being, you know, fire breathers and truth tellers and 
and hand holders and like it's about having that rec- right recognition or that right mechanism between support and challenge and um great teammates is the answer i, I want a great teammate and it sounds so um transactional but i want great teammates in my life and i mean that like in some respects my wife is yeah oh, she's gonna ask <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was a it was it was been by far my most um that and obviously having a, a child like uh, are one, I didn't have to work all that hard. It was kind of fun for me <laughs> to actually, you know, create a child. Um, the work of parenting is different. <laughs> and so parenting and and having a relationship was uh, the, the two things that I, I point to to say, if you want to know me, um, look at look at them. As you may know, this show, 10% Happier, has a companion app where you can go and learn uh, how to put into practice all the great things you learn here on the show. As I like to think about it, it's uh, it's like the in college, uh, the podcast is the lecture and the app is the lab where you can go and pound all of the wisdom from the show directly into your neurons. The app is also called 10% Happier. It's available wherever you get your apps. Go ahead and download it today. So we're we're talking now about what what can we do about FOPO and and we've spent quite a bit of time on on the what you call the single greatest bulwark, which is having a sense of self and and purpose. Um, another tactic you discuss in the book is discernment. What do you mean by that? I love that you asked the question as if um, you don't have a formed opinion. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good, Dan. <laughs> nice job. Um, yeah. So discernment is one of the big sources of power for humans is to have, um, I'm going to make this very pedestrian and less esoteric, right? Less scientific. But when people have very interesting lives, and I don't mean that they've traveled the world and they've done whatever, you know, amazing things but they've lived very curious, interesting lives. They are interesting because they're int- deeply interested. And that that helps to create this ability to discern, to have reference points, to bounce ideas or um, behaviors off of. So discernment is kind of drilling down to the truth of something. And one of the ways to do that is have very clear, um, durable, universal uh, reference points. and. Um, Discernment is that mechanism to to have uh, a decision making process to say yes or no or maybe or I'm not sure. Like discernment is that that ability to um, make choice and inform choice. You also specifically talk about discernment within the context of the serenity prayer of like being able to discern things you can control and can't. Mm. At one level, that sounds like it's been so overplayed, but it is such a first principle to know what's in your control and what's not. And what I've learned from people that are true masters, both, and I'm far more interested in mastery of self than mastery of craft alone, but people that are truly committed to the path of mastery, they are not interested in just knowing what's in their control and what's not in their control. They're not interested in just controlling the controllables, you know, that that phraseology. They are fundamentally committed to mastering the things that are in their control. And they kind of look sideways like, well, what else is there? Like that, that's, of course, I'm going to want to put myself in a position to master something. And to, for me to master it, I have to be able to um, fully control it. And and that is like your, basically your inner life. Um, is the short answer to what's in your control. Um, it makes very little sense to try to control something that you cannot control. You you are deleveraged. You are in a position of uh, low power in life, like thinking or even entertaining, um, am I going to win or not? It's not in your control. But concretely focusing on having, um, you know, the, the, available access to the best version of your thinking and the best version of arousal regulation and emotional harnessing and being able to respond eloquently and quickly with precision, both from a technical standpoint, a physical standpoint, and of course, mental, then then we're onto something. And so 
true masters are committed to mastering what's one hundred percent under their control, and FOPO is not part of that. You know, another person's thoughts are not in your control at all. Full stop. You said before, and I agree with you that the serenity prayer is, you know, <laughs> can't be overplayed. It's, you know, knit onto pillows and things like that. And I, I mean, I'm not here to criticize any of that, but it's not the most subtle or novel insight. And speaking personally, I actually find um, that remembering the heart of the serenity prayer, which is, you know, being able to see clearly what I can control and what I can't is incredibly useful, especially for somebody who like me has a, a, a high degree of anxiety. A lot of my anxiety centers around things like work and money. And I can very easily, um, fall into a kind of fearful projection about, Oh, X is going to happen. And then it, you know, it ends on like, we're going to lose the house and whatever. Um, and if I can just remember like, ah, uh, you know, uh, this is wasted energy. Um, and I get what I yeah. need to, the bottom line is no matter what happens, I can deal with it. And then I can move on with my, with my so dad. That, uh, that deep trust that you just like eloquently referenced, that's it now. That's it. Whatever. People that have that deep trust, I will figure that out too. Whatever's coming down uh, the future lane of mine here, I'll I'll figure that out too. Like there's a freedom that comes with that. And so I, when I hear you say it, like, yeah, I'll, I'll figure that out too because I've got a whole body of work of figuring stuff out. And sometimes it's harder, sometimes it's easier, but I've got a history of figuring stuff out. The other thing is like when we start to... You know, a big part of anxiety is um, the mind running rampant about all the things that could go wrong later. And that's using your imagination to try to solve a problem. It's, but it's the repeating of that experiment. What if this and what if that? Oh, no, no. What? Yeah, what if A and what if B? Wait, hold on. Let me go back and think about A again. It's that rumination and repeating of trying to solve something is, is one, the off ramp to that is coming back to the present moment and, you know, focusing all of your essence to an inhale or exhale or the task at hand or listening to another person speak. And when you can go from the, the, the imagination loop of future catastrophe to the, the present moment focus of a task, um, it, it's one of the great inoculations. And that is what of, of that type of anxiety. And that's why FOPO is this, is this imagination loop left unchecked, left unexamined, left undisciplined in many respects. And then to say, to just recognize and be aware, like, oh, I'm spending a lot of my energy and thinking resources um, about what they might think of me. Holy shit, like come back to right here, right now, be in my body and then choose where I'm going to put my attention. And imagination is a really cool process. It's an amazing process that athletes, some of them, um, have deeply invested in. And we know a lot from the science of imagination, of mental imagery and visualization. And anxiety is a way to, th to use your imagination, but its aim is toward all the things that could go wrong. And athletes tend to use their imagination to see a beautiful future, one that they are highly proficient in. <laughs> and so you can also choose how you think about the future based on how you practice thinking about it as well. We're ticking through the list of things we can do about FOPO. Uh, next item is uh, one that I suspect will go down easy with this crowd, um, meditation. Say, say a little bit more about how meditation can help. No, it's one of the three most significant practices to increase awareness. And um, your community will go, yep, yep, yep. Wait, 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 wait. There's more <laughs> than meditation? Yeah, there's two more at least. Um, meditation, again. Tier zero for meditation is increased awareness. Increased awareness, I think, of at least four things. Your thoughts, your feelings, your body sensations, we can call those emotions. And the fourth is outside of you, the unfolding world around you. So when you increase your awareness of those four things, you're able to adjust just a little bit more accurately, a little bit more easily. You're able to um, have more... Uh, more of an ability to get down into the truth of something. 
when you're not whipped around by the world, but you're actually kind of in a balanced way attending to your thoughts and emotions and, and feelings and the unfolding nature around you. So there's also two other great practices. But let me stay first on meditation and mindfulness here is that with a mindfulness practice to increase awareness, um, there's a couple of things that happen, obviously, but relative to FOPO is that you become more aware of the excessive worrying about what they're thinking. You're more aware of how much you're checking uh, in, in, into the eyes of others if you're okay. You're more aware of the way that you're responding um, to the felt experience of maybe not being or maybe being rejected. So the whole inner game is, am I being accepted or rejected? That's the, that's the broth of this FOPO soup. And, and again, the fear of rejection is a near death sentence to our brain. So we are heightened in our awareness of that. But we also need to become more aware of how we're responding, how we're actually showing up in a relationship, how much we're checking, and all the anticipation ahead of time. And when you are more aware, you give yourself a chance to do something about it, to course correct, to adjust, to notice. And the other two practices just to round it out are journaling. That too is a forcing function for awareness building. Um, and the third is conversations with people of wisdom. And people of wisdom, you know, tend to hold up mirrors pretty well. And so that's a forcing function for awareness as well. Those are the three. Can you say more about journaling? I actually have never really done much journaling. What What is it and how do I do it and, and how does it help? Yeah, I don't, I don't love it myself. So I can teach, but I don't embody it, right? And so um, I can give you the kind of, I'll, I'll just not get into the mechanics of what some best practices could be, but I'll start at the more general level is that when you have a blank piece of paper and you've maybe got a, a prompt that you want to explore, like um, what did I enjoy today or what challenged me today, or, or it's just a blank piece of paper that you're reflecting on your experience um, today, or you're thinking about something in the future, that it, there's a forcing function. You know when you're lying. You know when you're being honest. You know when you, you choose between this word and that word, um, the feelings that are evoked from it. So it's a, it is a forcing function to become more aware of the word choices and the commitments and the feelings um, that, that follow on. So uh, it's private. You know, there's, there's usually not somebody else that's checking your journal. Maybe, I don't know. But it's usually a private experience to, to create a bit of a sanctuary bet between, you know, lowering the, um, the threshold between how you're thinking and the concreteness of those thoughts. The other thing you mentioned was conversations with wise people. I believe you use the term in your book, um, create a round table. Mm. Yeah. So this goes back to, you know, carry, caring and worrying. And there are some people, I don't want to worry. I, I, for most things, I really don't want to worry at all. And I certainly don't want to worry if I'm in the, if I'm okay, based on what you might be thinking of me. But I do care about some people's opinions and their thoughts. And um, I, I created, for me, I needed some sort of mechanism, like who are they? And I, I didn't want a list. I'd like to use my visual sensations uh, around it to invoke and imagine my imagery. So I just, I got a round table in my mind and I thought eight chairs felt pretty good. <laughs> I could manage those eight relationships in my mind. And to have a seat at the table, there's two criteria. First criteria is time under tension, that we have time together where they know my scars, they know my, my traumas, they know my dreams and ambitions, and we've got time under tension. So when they say something, it's in context of, of all of me. And so that's one way to earn a seat at the table. And the other way is, and it's better if you have both of these, but not everyone does, that that you've really gone for it in your life, like really understand what it means to go for it. Is I believe it's a axiom of mine that um, that there's so much more potential that lies dormant, and those that are able to push on those edges to fundamentally commit to growing towards their potential, um, that type of courage is highly valued by me. So those are the two criteria, time under tension and have really gone for it in their life. And so, um, 
yeah, you, you could have other criteria. Those are just the criteria that, that are useful. And, for and so at least one benefit there would be, we're, we're not saying you should not care about other people's opinions. You're saying, we're saying let's not get wrapped up in unconstructive rumination and anxiety around other people's opinions. And um, if we are in some systematic, regular way, checking in with people whose opinions are very valuable to us in some way that can inoculate us against this miasmatic, nebulous dread we might feel about the rest of the world. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so that that's how you said it's, I wish that I had those <laughs> thoughts in the book, like that was really well said, um, is that the, the noise to signal ratio, or I'm sorry, signal to noise ratio, SNR, is an engineering term. It's also a psychological term. And so the way that I think about the round table of eight is that's a signal. And the noise is um, the people who don't really know me. Their, their idea might be really good. Their opinion might be factually accurate, but it's, I, for some reason, because of my traumas and scar tissues, like I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to accept it. It's just like this data point that's just out there. And if I don't do something to corral the signal I can easily get caught in the noise. And so um, I need I need some separation and distance between the noise. And most of us have a lot of noise, meaning a lot of opinions um, about like how we're doing and what we're doing as far, you know, at work and in creative arts and dress and, you know, choice of words. And I just, I need to be more locked into um, a signal because I, I can easily find myself frayed in the noise. Likewise. Another piece of advice in the book is um, instead of wondering what people are thinking, uh, just ask them. Uh, that that makes sense, although it sounds like it may be easier said than done. I think I think that uh, that research is really pretty pretty remarkable. Is that they the researcher put together um, couples that were married 10 years and longer. And that's kind of the, the, the time frame when we can start to finish each other's sentences. Like we know each other, we, we have an idea of how those, they, they form their thoughts and what they're likely gonna say. There's like, there's a knowing of each other, that, that marker for most relationships. And what they found is that um, they didn't differ all that much in being able to finish each other's sentences than relative strangers, like people that knew each other, but not all that well, not a whole lot of time under tension. There was a difference. People with 10 years or more did know each other better, could finish each other's thoughts, could guess what another person's thinking, but not all that much. However, what was remarkable is the overestimation that we think we, just because we've been around somebody, that we know them far greater than we actually do. And that's the dangerous delta. So yes, when you know someone, you're better than, than guessing the ideas of people that you don't know very well, but we think we are exponentially better. So it, the, the takeaway of that research is we're not very good at this mind reading thing. <laughs> we're really not. So if you want to know what another person's thinking, the most powerful thing you can do is say, hey, what are your thoughts on this? Or when I said that, I noticed that you had a, I thought, I think you had a reaction to it. Like, I hope you can be honest and tell me you know, what I was feeling. And I, I'm happy to be totally wrong on it, but like, did I, did I pick up on something? And so with enough kind of safety in those type of exploratory relationships, hopefully people can be honest. And it is one of the greatest mechanisms for speed of trusting each other is to have those com types of conversations. Well, the safety seems to be the key variable. I think that's what I was pointing at when I made the comment that it's maybe easier said than done. You know, I can imagine people not feeling comfortable oh, with their yeah. boss, for example, or again, if you're, you know, the only female in a largely male environment, you might not feel comfortable, et cetera, et cetera. That's exact. That is a hundred percent true. In some environments there's enhanced, this is where that psychological safety research was, it was, and is very, very powerful. And where it goes sideways, um, psychological safety is that when it's a an emblem for, well, I, if we are creating a psychologically safe environment so that I can speak truth to power, so that I can bring my ideas forward, that is also equivalent to I can bring my whole self to work. Not necessarily. You know, and 
Psychological safety does not, does not mean that. Um, it doesn't mean that if I want to wear outrageous, some sort of clothing, but I am, I'm a customer facing and that's not how the brand wants to dress that I have the right to do that. And I'm being kind of silly in this, in this story, but psychological safety, and this is polarizing psychological safety does not mean we're doing therapy at work. And it does not mean that you can bring your whole self. It means that there's enough space and safety to speak truth to power that when you do say something or agitate for something that you're not um, yeah. run out of the building or run off the team. And that type of safety is radical for innovation, for risk-taking, for, um, you know, uh, planning, for strategy. It's a, it's, a, it's a really important component to high performance. One of the last things you talk about in the book when it, when it comes to like sort of, you know, how to handle FOPO, you call it, you know, I believe you call it a, you know, a, a litmus test is, you know, thinking about the circumstances in our life within the context of mortality. Can you say a little bit more about that? You know, you and I, um, we haven't seen each other in a long time. And um, after, after this conversation, I, I don't know when I'm going to get to see you. And so most likely we'll have a salutation, you know, it's like a see you later or okay, bye, thanks. As if we're going to see each other soon. And this holds up true in our relationship and it holds up true in, you know, um, with our kids and our spouses and our loved ones, which we say goodbye as if we're going to get another shot. But that's not necessarily the case. Matter of fact, we don't know that with any certainty. We are banking on our history that every time we've said goodbye, we, we've actually up until this point had another chance, but we don't know when the end happens. And so, so I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to the shot clock analogy, just using a sport analogy, which is um, if we treated time just a little bit more preciously, and this is not a new idea, but this is just reminding us that um, we don't know when it's going to end. And as a forcing function, it, it can help us be more tuned and more present and, you know, demanding and calling for our very best with each other because we don't know where we'll get another chance at it. So I'm just saying, if we live like life with a shot clock, where it felt like it was more precious, you know, the 35 second shot clock forces you to take action in an NBA game that lasts 48, you know, minutes in total. And so just having that shot clock approach um, was just a fun, clever way of saying, um, when you say goodbye, maybe mean it. And if you say goodbye to seven people a day, uh, after a while, when you say goodbye to, when I say goodbye to you, it's actually preparing me, not that I'm going to, whether I'm going to see you or, or not again, it's preparing me for my next relationship with the next person that I get to have an engagement with. That when I say goodbye to you and I have a moment, like, I don't know if I'm ever going to see you, thank you. And I've really enjoyed our time. Thank you. And I feel fortunate to be in your life. And then I go to the next person. It's priming me to be more attentive, you know, to the fragility of that relationship too. So it's this um, calling for recognizing the fragility and the shot clock is just a, I don't know, it's just a, a way to think Given about that it. we all have limited time, do you want to spend it obsessing about what people may or may not think about you? Amen. Amen. And and as we're rounding, using a sport metaphor one more time, as we're rounding third base here, there's a, there's a friend of mine who has passed away. And um, his name is Nate Hobgood Chittick. He played in the NFL for a number of years. He won a Super Bowl. Um and he died early. You know, he, he was only uh, in his late 30s. He died early. And I bring him in the book because, um, bring him into the book because he taught me this thing about a screen pass. And so in football, there's a thing called the screen pass, which is, you know, um, it's a lateral pass and you've got a bunch of people running in front of you to protect you from getting tackled. And so the runner is literally running behind three of the largest humans on the planet and trying to you know get get the ball into the end zone. And um, so he said to me, Mike, you have no idea what it's like to be screamed at by adults six to four inches in front of your nose with such vitriol and such frustration in front of your peers, in front of people that are trying to take your job that you're not doing good enough. He said, it was so overwhelming for me 
in Pop Warner, in high school, in college, that finally my third year in college, I had to put up what I called a screen. And no one taught me how to do this, but I used my imagination. I created a screen and the only things that were, were could come through the screen were the things that were going to help me be a better me. And everything else that was negative, destructive fell on the coach's side of the screen. For example, this is the way he said it. A, a coach would say, Nate, I've told you a thousand times. I don't know when you're going to get it through your thick skull. I've told you it's a half step. You are taking a full step. You're getting beat all the time. You're never going to make it to the next level. You're an embarrassment to this team. I don't, how do you live with yourself? You're letting us down all the time. It's a half step, Nate. I did a little bit of ad lib there. But, um, but so the only thing that would come through the screen was, oh, half step, got it. Everything else would fall away. And so you have to discern. You really have to focus and have a mechanism to be able to say what comes in and what doesn't. What is the signal? What is the noise? Am I going to attend to how I look to my peers, how he's thinking of me, or am I going to make a fundamental commitment to get better? And this is what I love about athletics. There's a lot of things that I could say, uh, give me pause. I've spent the last 25 years in elite sport. But one of the things I love about sport is that they have made a fundamental commitment in their life to become their very best. And it tends to look technical and physical. Oftentimes, there's a whole set of mental practices that sit underneath of it. They don't just say they want to be their best. They work every day to get right to the razor's edge where they could fall into a thousand pieces or break through to a new unlock. And they're doing it in front of people that are trying to take their job. They're doing it in front of people that are de deciding whether they get a chance you know, at the next game or not. And the stakes are real, they're high, and they make that fundamental commitment to be vulnerable in that way every day. And it does not mean that athletes are the emblem for the good life or flourishing. We all have problems, every industry, every, every industry, but that is special. Most of us don't know what it's like to be publicly um, statted and examined and um, publicly called out for both success and mistakes. And it's pretty radical. And they make that commitment. This has been fascinating. Is there, are there areas you were hoping to go that we didn't get to? No, uh, no. I think the only area, Dan, is like to to see if you personally resonated with FOPO. And I wish I would have asked that earlier. Um, you know, like, do you see yourself, I know you've been very public with anxiety, but do you see FOPO as part of your- Oh yeah, makeup? absolutely. I don't, I don't think it's unique, um, which is actually liberating, um, but a thousand percent. I had an experience just last night where one of the big aspects of- um, panic, which is something that I intermittently struggle with, is this sense of, are the people I'm panicking in front of going to think I'm insane? Like if I'm on an airplane and I feel claustrophobic, one of the strands of fear, if I'm paying attention, that's running through my mind is these people are going to think I'm crazy. And like last night, for some reason, I was struggling a little bit to get on a subway in New York City and I was waiting for an empty car because I didn't want to freak out in front of other people. Um, and so, yeah, I absolutely, and even on a on a lower sort of more quotidian, mundane daily level, um, you can, I have not found a way to have a, a career as a public figure where I don't have some degree of fear about what people are thinking of me. And what I found useful in this discussion is to delineate between caring and worrying, and that that I think makes complete sense. Because I, I should care. I should care. Is my message resonating? How's this joke going down? How's this argument going down with me? I should care about that. But worrying too much about it, every little facial expression and how that's going down and, you know, what some person who's having a bad day may or may not say on Instagram, that's not helpful. Yeah. And then let's open that up one more level, which is caring about another person's experience is different than caring a la, and now I'm closer to worrying, am I okay in their eyes? So there, there's, I feel a great responsibility on the Finding Mastery podcast that people are giving their time, super precious. And I feel that I care 
I do, I deeply care that the way that we're shaping a conversation or whatever it is, that, um, that it's a good use of their time. Now, that's very different than worrying. Am I okay? Do they think I'm okay? Is this all going to go away? That excessive worry or even that little bit of worry is fundamentally different about caring. And so um, I, th- I think to your point, we need more care. Yeah. We need more compassion and empathy. We need more strength um, from that from that posture as a, and, and we need less worry. You know, so I love that. And um, Dan, that that panic stuff is um, as constricting of the experience of like, oh my god, my heart rate is pounding, my breathing and uh, is outrageous, and I'm sweating like a like a. Am I going to die? Like that's kind of the panic experience in its purity, right? Am I going to die? Is this is this a heart attack? Wait, is this panic? I'm not sure. You you're probably more familiar with the difference between the two now, but it's so it's the the fear that you're going to have that in a public setting is oftentimes reported to be worse than the experience itself, and that too I think is the FOPO mechanism yeah. working its way in there. Yeah. Is that um, yes. what will they think of me as I? fall yes. into a ball of mush, <laughs> sweating and breathing and panting with my pupils looking kind of crazy and me not knowing what to do with myself. Um, I, I I wonder how much freedom you have by announcing it. Like, hey, you know that mole that or that ward on my nose that you haven't wanted to look at? Well, I know it's there. And I'm just saying that I have a big ward on my nose. You know, um, there's a joke in there somewhere about yeah. don't look Austin at the Powers. mole or the ward on, on his nose. Yeah, right. So like, I wonder if you found the freedom from just announcing it, from calling it what it is that, hey, there's this thing I have. My show up at yeah. this dinner party, I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd rather take my own skeletons out of the closet than have somebody else do it. Yeah, that's cool. that's a cool insight right there. And also, yeah. if there's you have stuff a, I'm, not, I'm hiding about mm-hmm. myself, it's just like, that's, that's talk about RAM, you know, or, you know, apps running in the background that are killing my battery. It's, I'd rather just... Put it out there. Yeah, I I think that that level of courage um, is to be celebrated, and the the path to get there means you really know yourself. You've done some work to say, "Hey, th- here's the shadow part that I'm trying to protect." Uh, I, I don't want to spend all that energy on trying to protect it, so here it is. And um, you know what? If it makes you really uncomfortable that I might fall into a thousand pieces, you know, kind of that sweat blob. That's what, at least what panic feels like to me. That um, I don't know. Maybe we're exactly. not going to be able to work out as a friendship or as a business partner or whatever, because this exactly. is me. You mentioned the podcast. Um, that just puts me in mind of something I, I like to do at the end of every show, which is just push my guests to just promote all the stuff you're doing. Because I, if somebody's made it this far in the interview, I suspect they want to know. Just remind us again of the name of the book, uh, the audio book you did with Pete Carroll, um, your podcast, your website, your socials. Just please give us the whole Megillah. So the the website has all of that. And so if there's one thing to remember, it's findingmastery.com. The podcast is called Finding Mastery. We sit down with the world's best about how they've designed their inner life. Um. The book, uh, the current book right now is called The First Rule. Stop worrying about what people think of you. Get that anywhere. And the the book that I wrote was Coach Pete Carroll, the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks, is an audio only version. And it was an Audible original. And so that's only found on Audible. And that's called Compete to Create. And the social handles are fun. You know, LinkedIn, we're really active on LinkedIn and Instagram. And so um, both of them are my my name, Michael. Gervais, and you spell it G-E-R-V, as in Victor, A-I-S. Always a pleasure, Mike. Thank you very much. Dan, I appreciate you.